Okay, so we're back in the book of Philemon. Seems like we've been gone from there for a while, and I'm glad to be back because I really wanted to be able to get into that study. It's such a beautiful book, and it teaches us about the central essence of our faith in Jesus, and that is forgiveness. So now that we're going back, I think it would be good, since it's been a few weeks, for us to do a quick review of since the time has passed of my injury and and some other things in between. So let's go back now and let's read together, starting from the beginning, Philemon 1, 1 through 7. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Athia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake, for I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Now we know that the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to his brother Philemon, and we know that Philemon has a church in his house, right? He's a wealthy man, and so God has blessed him with, with, a, with a nice big house. And what did he do with that wealth that the Lord's given him? When he committed his heart to the Lord, he, said, he opened up his home. He said to the church, you need a place to meet? Come and meet in my house. So he turned his personal house into a house of worship. Is that what we should do with our homes? Should our homes that the Lord's given us become a personal home only, or should it become a house of worship so that whoever comes in is going to be blessed? I love the example that Philemon said. He opened the doors of his house and he said, come on in, church. Let's make this a house of worship. Let's do the same. Let's follow that example. We talked about Philemon's characteristics, the characteristics or the character qualities of a Christian who understands God's commandments to us to be forgiving. We contrasted the way that the world has indoctrinated us to believe that vengeance represents strength. And yet we've learned throughout all that we've studied in the scriptures, now and in times past, for those of us who have been in the word, that the essence of God's forgiveness is what? It's grace, isn't it? It's his grace. And that is the strength that we have as believers because it's his grace that empowers us and brings us together. It brings out the strength in our character because we know that grace is alone from God. It's the finished work of the cross that gives us our forgiveness. And as a result of that, we extend that same grace to others around us. That's what builds strength into our character, the grace of our Father in heaven. As I mentioned in the introduction of the book of Philemon, the world doesn't exalt the virtue of forgiveness, does it? In fact, the world goes just the opposite. It, it indoctrinates vengeance and unforgiveness as a strength and the character quality of a person who really knows how to take charge and get the job done. We've got to ask ourselves, though, as believers, are we indoctrinated to that same belief system? So often we think we're, we're beyond that, but yet the culture affects us, doesn't it? What is it that we know to be true about forgiveness? Do we believe the scriptures, and what the scripture says about forgiveness? Or do, are we listening to the world? We've learned that forgiveness is at the heart of our relationship with Jesus the Savior, and as a result, he calls it to be at the center of the relationships that we have with one another. Unforgiveness destroys the relationships, doesn't it? We've all seen that, how it works. The enemy uses it. How many times have we all experienced that in our lives, how unforgiveness operates right in our own personal hearts in our lives, and it affects other people, other lives around us? It's so easy to see how unforgiveness operates in the life of other people, isn't it? We see other people and say, well, you should be forgiving. We see how it looks on them when, they're, when you see that ugly unforgiveness. You see that vengeance attitude. And we can see it on someone else, but we don't see it quite as easily on ourselves, do we? Why is that? Because we're living in our own flesh, don't we? And our own flesh often gives us justification why we're holding on to things, why we hold on to unforgiveness. Well, you don't understand how, how that person treated me in this situation. We know what the scripture says about it, and yet we still hold on to unforgiveness. And what effect does it have on us as believers? It locks us into bondage, doesn't it? Bondage of the past. 
And the insidious nature of that is that we're living ineffective lives right here and now in the present because we're caught up in something that is in the past. We can't change it. We can forgive. We know God forgets and wipes it out. But praise the Lord, we can forgive and let those things go that entangle us and keep us from living the life that he wants us to live right here and now in the present. It pollutes our thinking, doesn't it, unforgiveness? It corrupts our ability to be at peace and enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. You're not experiencing the joy and the fruit of the Spirit like you should when you have this unforgiveness in your lives. And once you're out of fellowship with the Spirit, once you're out of fellowship with the Spirit, you're grieving the Holy Spirit, you open the door to the enemy, and the enemy comes in and he makes all kinds of trouble in our minds, doesn't he? That's what he wants to do. He wants to stir up trouble in our lives so that we become ineffective as ministers of the gospel of peace in the world. We lose the joy of our salvation because of unforgiveness. And life can just become overwhelmingly impossible because of unforgiveness. And remember, we contrasted that with, with what the Apostle Paul has to say concerning Philemon as a brother as a, and his character and the call that Apostle Paul will give to him concerning his runaway slave Onesimus. Now, if you recall, I gave you guys this, a, a list. Not an exhaustive list by any means, but a list of some of the elements of forgiveness that we've all learned about, and I want to I give that to you. Number one, forgive in the same manner as Jesus has forgiven us, unconditionally and quickly. That's how he's forgiven us, isn't it? Just unconditionally and immediately upon asking. Number two, there is no limit to the amount of forgiveness that we must offer to one another. Number three, we must lavish upon one another forgiveness so that full restoration takes place. That's what our goal should be, full restoration in the relationship. Number four, brokenness and humility. Repentance and a contrite heart over our sins leads us to seek the Lord for forgiveness. Number five, faith in God alone leads us to the forgiveness of our sins. Number six, the forgiveness of our sins required the greatest sacrifice that God alone could make, and that was the giving of his only son. Let's go to Philemon 1, 7. And I want, to see, I want you to see how this is just completely captured here. For I have come to have much joy. Now the Apostle Paul is talking to Brother Philemon and this is what he's saying to him. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Remember I gave you the challenge. How many, people, how many people's hearts are being refreshed and comforted because of you? Well, I can guarantee you something right now. Unforgiveness is just the, exactly the opposite of that refreshment that the Apostle Paul is talking about. So the Apostle Paul is appealing to Philemon, telling him, this is, what, this is how you're known as a brother. You're bringing refreshment to the hearts of the saints, of the believers. I mean, w w isn't that great to have the Apostle Paul say that about his character? Is he say, could he say that same thing about our character? He calls him brother. How many people's hearts truly being refreshed right now because they're in a relationship with us? That's a question we have to wrestle with. We can get awful busy doing all sorts of things that we think are so productive. I got to do this and do this and do this and do this. And I, when I get done doing this, everything is going to line right up and my life is going to be completely in order and I'll be effective. You know what? You can stop all that stuff. Go back to the list of forgiveness that we just talked about. Look at the list that's required no, look at the list that we're privileged to be able to hold on to, God's grace and his forgiveness. And if we start exemplifying that and sharing that with the people that God brings into our lives, their hearts are going to be refreshed. More so than if we do all these other things that we say that we need to get done. Because we can get awful busy doing a lot of things, can't we? Hallelujah and amen to that. I know for myself, I was really busy the day I cut my finger off. Had to get something done. Had to be in a hurry. Had to do this, had to do that. Sometimes the Lord allows things to happen in our life to slow us down and to think and meditate on him and see what things are really, truly important.
We know that the Apostle Paul was saying all these things to Philemon, and we know that something's coming, right? So he's saying, Philemon, all of these things about Philemon, these are so true, and this is a wonderful thing. We know he's going to make an appeal to him, don't we? He's going to make an appeal to him. We're going to study about that today. We're going to read about this appeal that the Apostle Paul is going to make to him in the, in the context of those things that he said about him, about his love, about his, about his character. If you've been reading ahead, you know what the Apostle Paul is going to ask. You guys have been reading? I said, read the whole book because it's only one chapter. Just read it over and over. It's beautiful. So if you've read it already, you know what he's going to ask him I, without even me telling you. He's going to ask him to do what? He's going to ask him to forgive his runaway slave unconditionally and quickly with full restoration. In fact, even beyond full restoration. He's going to ask for him to do more than just fully restore him. He's going to ask him to receive him now as a brother, not just as a slave. What kind of person unconditionally forgives? What kind of person unconditionally forgives? It's a tough assignment. We like to believe that's us, don't we? Are you a person that unconditionally forgives? I think of myself as a very forgiving person. I mean, I have all kinds of situations, and I think I, you know what? I catch myself sometimes, and the Lord gives me the conviction. And it's like, you know what? Really, at the root of this problem right now is unforgiveness. You know, there's a situation going on. You're struggling with someone. You know what the root of it is? Unforgiveness. It's just exactly the opposite of his grace, isn't it? It doesn't refresh the heart. So what kind of a person unconditionally forgives? The answer is one like Philemon. That's why this, I'm convinced this letter is written so that we can look at this man Philemon and see what God has done, how he's blessed him. He had love and faith toward the Lord Jesus. We saw that in those verses, didn't we? He had a genuine love, it said, towards the fellowship of believers. He had a relationship that was right with the Lord and right with the fellowship of believers. And he had a knowledge of what God's word had to say concerning forgiveness. We need to be equipped as saints to know what God's word says, don't we? How can you obey something if you don't know what it says? How can you know what his word, how do you know how do you know how to do what he tells you to do in the word if you don't know the word? If you haven't read his word. We've got to be Bereans. Study the word to know what it is that God says to us concerning forgiveness. And he brought glory to the Lord Jesus Christ by refreshing the saints through his godly lifestyle. He was living a lifestyle in his home and in his business, and everything he was doing was refreshing this heart's of the saints. That's what it means to be a believer who unconditionally forgives to be like Philemon. The Apostle Paul describes Philemon's faith as a faith that was effective because he had a deep experience with the Lord, an agape love. Remember we talked about that, the agape love that he had, which led him to be obedient. He was a man who brought refreshment to the fellowship. Today we're going to see how the Apostle Paul was going to call on Philemon to exercise his free will the Apostle Paul is going to say, you have a will to choose. He's going to acknowledge that free will, but he's going to call on, he's going to appeal to him to forgive unconditionally his runaway slave. And we're going to see how our belief in what God's word says about forgiveness must be translated into action. The same requirement is on us that we read about here concerning Philemon. Amen? We want to see how that translate, translates into action in our lives. Philemon 1, 8 through 14 is the text for the day. Let's read that together. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be, in effect, by compulsion, but of your own free will. Let's go back and look at 
verses 8 and 9, a little closer. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ in order to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. What did the Apostle Paul mean when he said, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper? Proper? What did he mean by that? Where did he get that confidence? That's confidence, isn't it? To say, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do this. The Apostle Paul, the answer, the Apostle Paul was commissioned directly by the resurrected Christ, wasn't he? He had an encounter with the resurrected Savior. And that's what he was saying when he said, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do this. That's the answer to that. You know that in order to be an apostle, you had to have seen Jesus. You had to have seen Jesus yourself with your own eyes. The Apostle Paul is saying, hey, I have this authority because of the experience that I had on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus, didn't he, on the road to Damascus? The world is constantly saying to us that the Apostle Paul has an ego problem. He's an egotistical, egomaniacal person. And why is that? Because people don't want to hear the truth, do they? They don't want to hear the truth concerning their sin and its ramifications. The truth of God's word condemns them. The Apostle Paul himself was a sinner. In fact, what did he say? He declared himself to be a chief of sinners. He was a persecutor of the people of the way, wasn't he? Zealot. He was the one who was responsible for the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr in the church. He was there leading the charge. So think about this man, who he was prior to his seeing the resurrected Savior. When he was on the road to Damascus, he was knocked down. His life was turned upside down. He had an experience with the resurrected Savior. So what the Apostle Paul is referring to here is that confidence that he has in Christ. He's referring to the authority that he was given by Jesus through that experience, through seeing him in his conversion. And what about us as believers in the world we live in today? Do we stand up with authority and represent God's word as we should? Because we've had an experience with the resurrected Savior, haven't we? If we've had an experience with the resurrected Savior, then we should be able to do the same thing. We, could, we should be able to order things. We should be able to command things to be done in the name of Jesus. You know, if you don't believe that, try it sometime. Next time you're in the workplace and somebody's copy, photocopying some kind of filthy joke or something, and they're going to post it right up on the wall, you know what you do? You walk up to them and say, I command in the name of Jesus that this cease to happen in this office place. Because this is wrong, and this is contrary to what God's word says we should do and how we should act as people. You think something will get done? You won't know unless you try. You won't know unless you speak up for Jesus, unless you speak his word into the equation. It changes everything, believe me. Yeah, you're an egomaniac when you speak the truth sometimes. Sometimes we're accused of that, but we know we're standing on God's word and his authority. We should do it in love, no doubt. We have had an experience with the resurrected Savior. We should be able to identify with what the Apostle Paul was saying by the authority that it was given to him through Jesus the Savior. What does the Apostle Paul mean when he says, I can order you to do what is proper? What is he saying? Paul is talking about the doctrine of the theology of forgiveness, isn't he? To do what is proper. What is proper? Forgiveness. It's not an option, is it? It's a commandment from the Lord. So often as believers, we believe that we have the option to choose not to forgive someone. It's like it's, We kind of think, well, it's because it's our free will. We can just kind of opt to choose not to. It is your free will, no doubt. God gives us a free will to choose, doesn't he? But once you choose to disobey the Lord, now you're in the wrong. Now you're outside his will. Now you've given place to the enemy. Yeah, you're faced with a situation. It's either going to be a temptation in life or a trial, isn't it? If you allow it to be a temptation and you allow the enemy to get in and you choose wrongly, guess what? You're disobedient to God's word. And you have grieved the Holy Spirit. If you find yourself in a situation where someone's done you wrong, you can view it as a trial. If you view it as a trial, then you take up the position that James challenged us to take up, right? Consider it all joy. When you encounter various trials, you see someone coming after you, it's a trial. What do you do with that trial? You give it to the Lord. You unconditionally forgive because this is what God's called us to do. 
by the, by the experience that each one of us as believers has had with the resurrected Savior, the one who's given us unconditional forgiveness, we extend that. And what happened? We find ourselves delivered by the Holy Spirit in the midst of our trials. Many have testimonies when, they, when the enemy has come against them and they've stood the ground and they've stood up for the right and they've stood up for what, what Jesus would have them do and they've made their stand and God has blessed them increased their faith and completed their faith, perfected their faith because they put their trust in him through the trial. We can't give in to the temptation of the enemy because what we're doing when we do that is we start believing the lie that the enemy told Adam and Eve in the garden in the beginning, that you will be like as unto God. Have we become like as unto God? Are we like as unto God? No, we're not, are we? When we act as if we have become like as unto God, it brings about all sorts of bitterness and anger and malice, and that's what unforgiveness represents. Because we're acting as if we're the judge, right? You're like as unto God. I'll decide who gets forgiven and doesn't get forgiven. We're not being obedient to the Lord. We're acting as if we're God ourselves. We're going to be the ones standing in judgment over people. Now, so often the Christian people are, are, are accused of being judgmental. I wonder if we're guilty, if we give them the fuel. Remember I told you this before. Are we giving them the fuel to, 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 for that, to justify that position? If they see unforgiveness in us in any shape or form, yes, we are. Yes, we are. And we're being like as unto God. We're taking God's rightful place for, for grace, and we're standing in the way of others coming to him. God's grace wants to do something in our lives, in the relationship that we have with each other. God's word is perfectly clear concerning the issue of forgiveness. We've already reviewed that, and we've discovered that forgiveness is the commandment from God, not an option. It's not an option, even though he gives us a free will to choose. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a free will. But may we, by your grace, Lord, choose to do what you have called us to do, to be obedient. Are we going to do it? That's the question. Are we going to do what God has commanded us to do out of a requirement of the law because it's a commandment for us, or are we going to do it out of love because the Holy Spirit appeals to us? He's appealing to us. The Apostle Paul was appealing to Philemon. The Holy Spirit is appealing to us, isn't he? He's appealing to us to love people, to do the right thing, not, cons not allow the enemy to come and tempt us, to be carried away by this, but instead to look at the trials that we go through as an opportunity to trust the Lord, to be a witness for him, and to obey him, to exercise the free will that he's blessed us with to choose Jesus, to choose to speak him into the office, to choose to speak him into our neighbor's life, to choose to speak him into every situation, to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials, as James said knowing the testing of our faith is going to produce endurance in us and make us perfect and complete in the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here in verse 9 when he says, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. He's, pre he's presenting to Philemon an appeal rather than a commandment. When the Apostle Paul says, quote, since I am such a person as Paul, he's describing himself as one who was a chief sinner and had already experienced God's unconditional forgiveness in his life. He, Paul had, didn't do anything. He didn't even repent, did he? He just got knocked down. The Lord stopped him right where he was and said, I'm going to show you unconditional grace. So what the Apostle Paul was saying, since I am such a person as Paul, having gone through what he went through, he says he's making this request to Philemon from that perspective, having experienced what he went through. Now, from that perspective, he's going to make this appeal to Philemon, to his free will to choose what he's going to do. But he also throws in, I'm old and I'm in prison. <laughs> you know what? You think about that. It's like, and by the way, too, I'm old and I'm in prison. It's like, oh, so now you're trying to pull on the heartstrings a little bit, Paul. You're trying, to, you're trying to eke out a little bit of compassion here, you know, in the situation, you know. Well, you know what? We're supposed to honor our father and mother that our days may be long and many. That's the commandment with the promise. Why is that? Because as we go through life, we, have, we gain experience, don't we? And the Apostle Paul had been, walk, he had walked through that territory. He knows the damage that unforgiveness can wreak in a person's life. So he's saying, hey, I'm old. So look, this experience that I have in my life is, is, relates to forgiveness. I want you to think about that. 
I want you to consider that when I'm, as I'm making this appeal to you. And also, I want you to consider the fact that I'm in prison, too. I'm not on some kind of a pride trip, you know, high horse asking you to do something I'm not doing. I'm in prison because I've been speaking the good word of the gospel. Amen? He's coming from a place of authority, isn't he? But yet he's still making an appeal. He's making an appeal. What he's doing is he's making a mention of his imprisonment to show his humility before the Lord and how it wasn't really the Romans, Paul said, that put him in prison. He was saying he was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he was still given glory. That's the example he wanted to set for Philemon. He was still given glory to the Lord during his time of imprisonment. Now, you know, being in some kind of an imprisonment situation, shackled up and everything, is not going to be pleasant. Put some kind, I had a little brace on my arm for just a couple of weeks, and it hurts. The brace hurts, you know what I'm saying? It's like there's just places on my arm that just feel worn out. Can you imagine having shackles around your legs for days and days and days? You, you have to be suffering. Sores, in chains, they were in chains. It has a way of humbling you. And yet the Apostle Paul in that situation, in humility, was making his appeal. And what he was saying is, Philemon, listen to me. I'm in prison because this is where the Lord Jesus Christ wants me to be. Now, what a position of strength, isn't it? That humility, as he expressed to Philemon, I'm going to ask you to exercise your free will to, to make a choice here, both from my experience, the walk that I've been on with the Lord, and also in humility because of the fact that I am now a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord that he viewed his situation as a trial and God exalted and used that to bless many other people. Because we know that Philemon got saved by the Apostle Paul's ministry. We also know that Onesimus came to be saved as a result of Paul being in prison there as well. And in that prison sentence that the Paul, that Apostle Paul experienced, what did he do? He wrote letters to the churches. In fact, it, this church in Philemon's house was the church of Colossae. So the book of Colossians, that letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, was written to the church that was in the house of our brother Philemon. I love how, this, how his word ties together. You go read the book of Acts. You read the, the letters to the church. You see how it all fits together. How much more should we be able to accomplish in life? How much more could we as believers accomplish in life if we would appeal to other people from our experience of walking with the Lord through these situations, and at the same time, from a position of humility, how much more effective could we be? If we see people saying to us, we're being judgmental as believers, it's certainly not because we're coming from a humble position. You understand what I'm saying? If we exercise the glory that the Lord wants to manifest through us, by being humble before people and being unconditionally forgiving. She's going to change everything. When we command something of others and use our experience, our life experience, as the world says, as the authority for that command, we incite others and provoke them to argumentation. We put ourselves out there as egotistical. But when we in humility appeal to others and use our experience as the basis for that appeal, people are much more likely to be open, much more open, and much more likely to respond to the gospel. We know that this presentation by the Apostle Paul is going to generate in Philemon an emotional response. We know it's going to generate one of compassion, isn't it? Philemon can't help but remember that the Apostle Paul is the one who led him to Christ. And he's going to think to himself, this is, the, this is coming from the Apostle Paul. Paul, who is old, and he's the one who led me to Jesus. And he's asking me to do this, and he's humble, and he's in prison. And we, we, we need to remember that Onesimus is standing at this time, right now. He's standing while we're reading this. He's standing before Philemon while the letter's being read. Because, see, he went back. The letter came back with Onesimus, didn't it, personally. And so as the letter's being opened and read, Onesimus, the runaway slave, is standing before Philemon. We know that Tychicus made the delivery of the letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at the same time. Tychicus brought the book of Colossians, the letter to the church at Colossae. He brought that with him because he accompanied Onesimus in returning back home. It's an amazing scene. 
an exact point in time where Philemon has to make a decision as to how he's going to respond. An amazing scene. The stage is set for Paul's appeal. And here it is. Here's his appeal. Let's go on now and read the heart of the appeal that the Apostle Paul is making to Philemon. Philemon 1.10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. Isn't that something? Here's the appeal. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus. He calls him his child. Why does he call him his child? Because he led him to Jesus. Whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. He led him to Jesus while he was still yet in prison. You can't lock down the gospel, can you? You know, the apostle Paul was operating in the spirit, and it didn't make any difference if he was locked up in prison. You can't chain the gospel. You can chain a human being, but you can't chain the gospel. Praise the Lord. Why was he useless to Philemon before? Why was Onesimus useless to Philemon? Because he was a slave with a rebellious heart, wasn't he? He had a rebellious heart. He was doing everything that he was supposed to do, but he was doing it simply out of obligation. And how is it that Onesimus became useful? He went from useless to useful, both to Paul and to Onesimus? I mean, both to Paul and Philemon? How is it that he became useful? The answer, when he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior, he repented of his rebellion and his sinfulness before the Lord, and he was transformed. He went from being faithless to a faithful servant. Faithful means one who is full of faith. He went to being a person who was full of faith. The Apostle, said, the Apostle Paul said he had proven himself to be faithful. How do we know that? How do we know that he'd proven to be faithful? It's implied here in these next verses, isn't it? The Apostle Paul's appeal to Philemon was to receive him. The Apostle Paul said to Philemon, receive him. And the first step that we know as believers in forgiveness is always to receive the other person in spite of the infraction. Forget about the infraction and what all it is that they've done. Receive the person. That's what God's calling us to do, to reach out and receive the person. As soon as they know that you're reaching out for them and receiving them and as, a, as a person, to love them, suddenly the infraction isn't exactly what Satan wants it to be. It can no longer be the thing that divides I have sent him back to you. I have sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart. Let's look at Philemon 1.12. I have sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart. I love that. I love that last part. Sending my very heart, the Apostle Paul. He's comparing the two. What the Apostle Paul is saying is, to Philemon is this. Receive Onesimus. Receive him. He's standing right there in front of you. He's right before you, Philemon. He's also telling him how to receive Onesimus. He's saying, receive him as if you were receiving my very heart. So what Paul is telling us in this statement is that we as the body of Christ are one. You understand that? We as the body of Christ are one. We should never exercise inequity, inequalities, when it comes to disseminating forgiveness as believers. In this case, the Apostle Paul is appealing to Philemon and giving him good reason even to receive him back. He's given him a good reason to receive him back. Verse 10 said, I appeal to you for my child who I have begotten in my imprisonment. The Apostle Paul knows firsthand, doesn't he? He knows firsthand that Onesimus accepted Jesus as his personal Savior because he led him to the Lord. He's saying this is a good reason. Paul says, Onesimus has repented, Philemon. Receive him now in humility and do it quickly. Here's the key. The proof that he had repented was the fact that he was there. Because the, the punishment for a runaway slave, uh, slave is death, isn't it? According to the law. The proof that he repented was the, fact, the very fact that he was there. He returned back to Philemon. He, he was obedient to what the apostle Paul told him to do. And what was he going to do? He was going to go back to Philemon and he was going to make things right. That's a perfect example to us. We were once formerly enslaved to sin. What do we do when we repent? When we repent of our sin, we need to go back to people and make things right. We need to be willing to do exactly what Onesimus did. We need to be obedient and go back to make things right. He was transformed, wasn't he? 
He was transformed as a person. We read in verse 11 that he used to be useless and now he has become useful. That's a transformation. It's a perfect description of a transformation. What a change Jesus makes in our lives, amen? He takes us from being useless and makes us useful. He takes us from faithless to faithfulness. He replaces our heart of rebellion with the heart of obedience. He changes our minds and he changes our attitudes. He causes us to want to go back and make things right. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Paul is saying, Philemon, here he is. Receive him now because he is now a believer. He has changed. He's going to be useful to you now. Look at him. The proof is right there. He's standing right before you. Remember that Tychicus is also there. He accompanied him. He's there, and what does he have in his hand? What does Tychicus have in his hand? He has the letter that Paul wrote to the church that's in Philemon's house. I just love the way God's word just intertwined. So here Tychicus is witnessing this. And let's see what the apostle Paul wrote in Colossians to the church there concerning the same matter. Colossians 3, 22 through 24. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. That's, is, is that, that's amazing, isn't it? When you look at that. You know, I so often through the years have read the word, and I read these passages that relate to slaves and masters, and I just, I never have been a slave, have you? Or have you? You know? I mean, I never think of myself as being a slave, and so I can read those passages, and I think to myself, well, I can't really totally identify with that position to be a slave to another master. But lately, the Lord's been showing me that in fact, we are all slaves, aren't we? Ever since the fall of man, we, we have to work with our hands and we have to toil and we have to struggle and we have to, we're accountable to other people and have to give an answer for what we're doing. This definitely applies to us because it's about an attitude, isn't it? Who we serve, who we work for. Onesimus was no longer a slave to sin. Before he, He's still a slave to Philemon, but he was a slave to sin before. Now, he's no longer a slave to sin, but now he's a slave to righteousness because he's, he's accepted the Lord. He's become a good slave to Philemon because he's doing his work. How? It's unto the Lord. Attitude is everything. It makes life enjoyable even when we're in hard work, doesn't it? Absolutely. What about us as believers? Are we good workers in the workplace because we do our work as unto the Lord? Do we do our work at work as unto the Lord? Or do we complain and struggle? Do we demonstrate that we're slaves to sin? Do we demonstrate that we're slaves to bad attitudes and we have this problem, oh, mine, the complaining about the boss and all those things. It's like if you're complaining about the boss, I got news for you, you're a slave. If you're doing your work as unto the Lord, you're a slave to righteousness, the boss can do and say and whatever. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to unconditionally forgive them and you're going to say, in the name of Jesus, I have to come against this stuff that's going on in the workplace because it's not right. But I receive you. And I have your, ar your arms are open wide. How can they resist that? They're provoked. Are we slaves to sin? Are we slaves to righteousness? Are we doing our work for men, to please men? Are we doing our work as unto the Lord? The Apostle Paul was telling Philemon that Onesimus was faithful, wasn't he? He was telling him, this man is faithful. Where do we see that? It's implied when the Apostle Paul said in verse 12 that he was sending his very heart. Paul is saying, I'm sending my very heart. What does that mean? What was the Apostle Paul's heart like when he met the resurrected Savior on the road to Damascus? It was, it was faithless, wasn't it? It was full of sin. He was a chief of sinners. He went from faithless to faithful in his experience. The Apostle Paul was comparing his heart to the sending of Onesimus. Why? Why was he doing that? Because the Apostle Paul's heart was faithful and so was Onesimus. He led him to Jesus. He saw the change in him. And he was telling Philemon, it's just exactly like the testimony of what the Lord did for me. It's the same thing. It went from faithless to faithful. 
And he was also telling Philemon, too, if we read in that passage, this was not an easy thing for him to do. It wasn't easy. But sometimes, you know what, believers? Being faithful to the Lord, he calls us to do hard things, doesn't he? It's not always easy to be faithful. There are people in the world right now standing up for their faith, having their heads cut off, yet remaining faithful. You know, there's an instant in time when they're suffering, right? And then just like that, they're in the presence of the Lord. Answering the call to be faithful is not always going to be easy. But in the end, in the end, what? In the long run, what? It's so much better, isn't it? Because we have no regrets. We live from strength to strength. Lord, help us to see these trials that you bring into our life as helping us to grow and to live from strength to strength and to be obedient to your word, to be forgiving people, to be loving people to be like the heart of the Apostle Paul and to be like our brother Onesimus, set free. Let's look at verse 13 now. Whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. The Apostle Paul is saying, whom I wish to keep with me. Who, who did he want to keep with him? Who was he talking about? Mm-hmm. He was, Paul was saying, I'd like to keep Onesimus here with me. He's saved. He's become just, just an incredible heart that's full of faith. And what's he doing? That on your behalf, Philemon, that he might minister to me in my imprisonment. So obviously, Onesimus was doing ministry for Paul. No telling what all he was doing. He was doing all sorts of things for Paul. Paul was chained up, and so therefore limited. But he was, Onesimus was doing things to minister to the apostle Paul. So it wasn't easy for the Apostle Paul to make this decision, but he knew it was the right thing to do, to send him back to Philemon. And he was going to miss the ministry that Onesimus was offering up to him as the Apostle who was called of the Lord to be chained up in prison. He was going to miss that. Isn't that an amazing description of the Apostle Paul's faithfulness, the faithfulness of his heart? And yet the Apostle Paul compared that to Onesimus. It's like sending my very heart, sending Onesimus to you, comparing the two. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he said he was ministering to him. How could, this, how could he possibly be ministering to the Apostle Paul while he was in prison unless Onesimus was faithful? You couldn't minister to the Apostle Paul unless you're a faithful person, could you? You couldn't be running amok and be ministering to the Apostle Paul's heart. He was faithful. There's something really subtle here, though, that I want us to take note of, and it's very easy when we're reading the word, sometimes to pass over details that are very important. Paul tied the ministry that Onesimus was doing for him back to Philemon. What the apostle Paul was doing was making it clear to Philemon that he recognized that Onesimus was his rightful slave. And the presumption on Paul's part is that Philemon, being such a loving man, such a loving man, would have done exactly the same ministry for him if he was able to be there in Rome. Do you see that connection? Can you see it? Answer me. Can you guys see that right there? Look at this. So that on your behalf, so what the Apostle Paul is saying is that Onesimus is doing ministry to me on your behalf, Philemon. He's doing it for, for you. That he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. It's a credit to Philemon, our brother Philemon, and his character. In other words, Philemon gets the credit for the ministry that Onesimus was doing for him, not only because Onesimus belonged to him as a slave, but had he been there himself, the Apostle Paul knows that he would have done it as well. What the Apostle Paul is also doing in this is making it perfectly clear that we as believers are all on a level playing field. We're all on the level playing field. It's only by God's grace that any of us are ever saved. Don't you love that? The Apostle Paul, locked down in prison, had to have the experience as an apostle seeing the resurrected Savior, says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you, Philemon. I'm, it's just the same thing as me sending my very heart. We can take that same message to, in our own lives and personalize it. We were runaway slaves. Sold to sin. We experienced the resurrected Savior, and what happened to us? We became slaves to righteousness. Useful, went from useless to useful, faithless to faithful. 
slave or free. Anytime we minister for the Lord, people, in any situation, we also do it for each other in the body of Christ. We could be completely away from one another and we can be ministering to someone in the workplace and we're doing it for this fellowship of believers as well. That's what this passage teaches us. When we witness to someone using the scriptures that the Apostle Paul was given by the Lord, when the Holy Spirit gave these scriptures to the Apostle Paul, when we use those to witness to other people, we're doing ministry not only to the Lord, but also into the Apostle Paul's heart. He's already in heaven and glory, and we're going to be there with him. And we're going to celebrate for all eternity. And what are those rewards in heaven? The people who are saved as a result of our testimony. Ministry unto the Lord is ministry unto one another is the same thing. We love each other when we minister for the Lord to other people. We're never disconnected as the body of believers. We're one in Christ. The playing field is level. Do you understand what I'm saying? The playing field is level at the foot of the cross. The Apostle Paul, in the culmination of this passage, is saying, look at him. He's saying, look at him, finally. I mean, he's repented. He's been transformed into a useful servant. He is so faithful that I wanted to keep him here with me to do the work that you're not able to do because you're not here. But I'm sending him back to you because this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to send him back to you in order that he might be reconciled back to you. That was the greater call, wasn't it? that the slave be reconciled back to the master. Paul made the declaration that Onesimus was ministering to him on behalf of Philemon, but Paul goes on to say in verse 14 to say that he does not want to take advantage. He does not want to take advantage of this ministry by placing the ministry that Onesimus had to him personally while he was in prison over the ministry and reconciliation that was to come, the restoration that was to take place between Philemon and Onesimus. Did the Apostle Paul have a heart for restoration? He did, didn't he? Do we have a heart for restoration? Are we willing to do the hard thing in life? Are we, are we willing to make sacrifices to, 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 to send forth and to take our resources and to bless other people so that other people are reconciled? Are we so concerned that the very heart of who we are as a person is concerned, more concerned about other people that we know being reconciled than we are about our own comfort? The Apostle Paul sent him back. It was a hard thing to do because Onesimus was ministering to him. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was rubbing oil around those, those ankles where those shackles were, just bringing comfort. But he said, you've got to go back because the Apostle Paul had a heart for restoration. He wanted to see Onesimus go back and get reconciled to his master. What about us as believers? Are we concerned about people that we know being reconciled? We could say we're concerned about reconciliation when it concerns us in a relationship with us because it's uncomfortable to be unreconciled, isn't it? We don't want that, that struggle. Are we rushing, though, to help others that we see out there that are struggling be reconciled? I guarantee you, you can be an agent of reconciliation for other people. You can have the heart that the Apostle Paul had. You can set your own comfort aside, and you can go after people that are unreconciled, and you can bring the gospel because the gospel sets people free. It takes him from useless and makes him useful. It takes him from faithless and makes him faithful. And you can speak it just like the Apostle Paul did with authority. Because you've had an experience with the resurrected Savior. You've had your road to Damascus. God's taken you from slavery to sin and made you a slave to righteousness. He's called you and given us a work to do. What are we going to do? Are we going to be agents of restoration? Or are we going to pass our opportunities by because every ministry that we do is unto the Lord we do for each other I mean this house right here on Saturday afternoon should be filled we shouldn't keep it to ourselves I know that I'm preaching the gospel I know I'm teaching the word the way it's supposed to be taught so let's fill the place up let's provoke those people that we know that don't know Jesus to get into the house so they can get blessed get saved or better yet let's get them saved in the workplace and then bring them here because we're supposed to be saints equipped to go out and take the good news to the lost world. Amen? Let's look at the last verse, verse 14, 114. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything. Now, what, whose consent? Philemon's consent, right? 
But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but about of your own free will. The Apostle Paul was saying, Philemon, I know you would have left him here to minister to me. I know you would have done that. But I wanted, I wanted you to make that choice yourself. Paul was saying that he recognized Philemon's character, that he was a forgiving man, a loving man, but he wanted Philemon to be able to experience what he had experienced. Now, what did Paul experience? He experienced Onesimus going from a slave to sin to a slave to righteousness. He experienced his conversion, his experience with the resurrected Savior. And he wanted Philemon to be able to see for himself firsthand the change that had occurred in Onesimus. And more importantly, Paul wanted Philemon to once again experience firsthand the power that we have available to us when we exercise our free will to do what? To choose to forgive. The Apostle Paul wanted Philemon to have that experience, to choose to forgive Onesimus and to see the effect, to see that restoration take place, to see him no longer just as a slave but as a brother. The lesson the passage of Scripture teaches us as brothers and sisters in Christ, we must always be ready to forgive and to receive one another. We must be agents for restoration and for unity in the body of Christ. The one question that seems to arise in my mind when I read this passage, one question, is how God has called us to forgive even those who are not members of the body of Christ, those that are unsaved. There's a special relationship that we have, don't we, as believers? We can't, that just cannot exist between those who are not saved. It doesn't exist. We know what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. We have this relationship. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. As we forgive them unconditionally, those who are not saved, guess what? They're going to be provoked to want to be like us. They already do want to be like us. In all of their misery and struggles, the world is making an attempt to do nothing more than to be like us, to be loved and secure and to be faithful and to, do, and to have the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and all of the things of which there is no law against. Think about that. That's what God's calling us to do as believers. What better way to show the world freedom than to show them unconditional forgiveness? How? How do we do that? We can demonstrate to the world that we're, we are believers by the way we forgive one another, by the way we love one another. The scripture says that they will be provoked to jealousy by the way that we love one another. They'll know that we're Jesus' disciples by the way that we love one another. How we receive one another with unconditional forgiveness. And by recognizing that only God can transform us from faithlessness to faithfulness. And sometimes we, when we forgive unbelievers, what happens? We're not restored, are we? We can forgive an unbeliever. God's called us to do that, to provoke them. But sometimes when we forgive them, there's no restoration in our relationship with them, is there? What we need to understand is that that's the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? That's the work of the Holy Spirit to call people to repentance. We're to be obedient and be unconditionally forgiving people, extending forgiveness to everyone all people. And then it's the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't it, to call them to repentance. Unconditional forgiveness on our part. What does it do? What does it do in the life of an unbeliever? Unconditional forgiveness. What it does is it removes their justification for their sin. It takes that away from them. And it also forces them to choose to accept or reject Jesus. You basically put them in a position. The unbeliever is forced into a position to either accept or reject Jesus. Could you remove the justification for their sin because you're out of the equation when you open up your arms and say, I unconditionally forgive you. I love you and unconditionally forgive you. I'm not making the issue here, the infraction. It's about you as a person coming to the Lord and being saved. That's the heart of restoration that the Apostle Paul is demonstrating and he's calling Philemon to demonstrate to his runaway slave who rightfully deserved death and punishment. Because not only did he run away, he stole from him too, didn't he? That's what, he? that's what the Lord's calling us to do as believers, to have that same exact attitude. You want to drive people to Jesus? Do you want to drive people to Jesus? Do you want to force people to come to Jesus? <laughs> it's like we say, no, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. What are you saying, Pastor Gene? Are you crazy? It's like, what are you saying, why would you even ask us that question? You just told us that the only way people come to the Lord is by the Holy Spirit calling them to repent. That's true, isn't it? 
But that doesn't mean we can't become offensive as Christians. I'm not saying be offensive. I'm saying we can go on the offense, can't we? How do we do that? The offensive weapon that we have as believers is what? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. What does it do? It divides, it corrects, it reproves. People can't stand this world and all of its nonsense and philosophical jargon and everything else cannot stand up to the Word of God. Speak His Word. You take your sword out, your offensive weapon, and put the Word on people. Force them and drive them to Jesus because that's what it does because it takes away, it removes all their silly justifications, all the, the, the relativism, all the situational ethics discussions and nonsense on and on and on and it goes. And it forces people to make a decision to either choose to accept his salvation and his forgiveness in their lives or to reject his salvation. Ephesians 6, 17, also a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He tells us to put on the full armor, the full armor as a defense against the attack of the enemy. But then he says the sword of the Spirit. That's our offensive weapon. Are we using it as believers? It's a wonderful thing to have an offensive weapon that goes hand in hand with unconditional forgiveness. When we choose to unconditionally forgive people, we open the door to take the word, the sword of the spirit, and go offensive and force them to make a decision to either accept or reject Jesus. And furthermore, you deliver yourself of all the trouble associated with carrying someone else's infractions and sins because you can't forgive them anyway. <laughs> you know, you can't forgive people of their sins. You can only... You can only turn them over to the one who can. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Like us unto. Lord, teach us to do the same and demonstrate your incredible glory. Your incredible glory. Your death and finished work on the cross and your resurrection power by doing just exactly that. As the Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans 13, the requirement of the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Remember, I taught you this. What is the one word? It's love, isn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. The fulfillment of the whole entire law, love. If we want to love people, we need to bring them Jesus into their lives. We need to get on the offensive and present the word of God, which always points us to be unconditionally forgiving of others. We must be like Jesus. The best way to do it, to be like Jesus, is through unconditional forgiveness. Once they see unconditional forgiveness of Jesus in your life, then they have to deal with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit calling them. Make a decision. We never look more like Jesus than when we forgive. Have you heard that said before? You never look more like Jesus. You never represent more accurately Jesus than when you forgive. You can't do it on your own, though, can you? We can't do it on our own. We need to cry out to the Lord to empower us unconditionally forgive people, to be people of unconditional forgiveness and restoration. Amen? Remember what our Saturday afternoon theme is? Jesus dependency, not self-sufficiency. Let's depend on Jesus to do that work in us so that we'll be like the Apostle Paul, so that we'll be like the brother Philemon, so that we'll be like Onesimus, because we're just like each one of them in different situations. But every single one of them consistently in the body of Christ, had the same exact experience, his unconditional forgiveness. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. And every ministry that we do unto the Lord is also to unto one another, to our very heart's ministry. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this incredible letter, a personal letter, Lord, that the Apostle Paul wrote to his brother Philemon, that we are able to read, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, that Philemon was obedient to you. From this letter, Lord, we know that he was definitely faced with a challenge to exercise his free will to choose, and he chose forgiveness, Lord. We thank you for that. And we thank you, Lord, that Onesimus was obedient, and he went back to make things right. Help us, Lord, to go back in our lives and make things right where we have sinned. Help us to have a repentant heart, to be transformed, to become faithful people, full of faith, Lord, and a witness for you. And we thank you for the Saturday afternoon service, and I just pray that there would be others provoked to come, Lord, to hear the word. I thank you for this gathering of believers. I thank you, Lord, for the incredible answers that you've given us and 
in, in our prayers to you, Lord, that we've lifted up to you. I just thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness to us. Help us, Lord. Empower us to be people. Unconditional forgiveness and restoration. Representing you, Jesus, to the world that's lost. Provoking them, driving them to make a decision. A decision for you, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.